Wojta Stolbenko is a poi spinner, performer, musician, videographer, instructor, retreat organizer, traveler, and most importantly, a wonderful individual. I've had the pleasure of seeing this man perform live and taken his in-person workshops. For those of you who don't know the significance of the work he has done and is currently still doing, hopefully this episode will provide you some insight. He is truly one of my favorite artists and people in the world. Welcome to the podcast and enjoy the episode, my friends. What's up, Voita? Yo. Thank you for being our ninth guest on the podcast. And uh, good morning to you, sir. Good afternoon. Good morning. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you for waking up at 6 a.m. to interview me. That's uh, admirable. <laughs> Re really quick, tell us where you're at right now. <clears throat> um, I'm in Sicily uh, in a beautiful place like... Um, I'm on a retreat, basically. Yeah. Uh, to Chilfoy, just a little bit. It's like the first retreat that I'm at that I'm not organizing myself. It took me like some time to to look at this thing from a new perspective. It's great, man. Like not having to like organize something and just enjoy it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure that you're not used to that. So I, I can see that you'd be enjoying yourself a little bit more. Um, so yeah. uh, real, real quick, before we get into all the retreat stuff and all that, um, take us back to how and when you got introduced to Poi. It was, it was a long time ago now, so bring us all the way back. Hmm. Yeah, it is a long time ago. Almost feels like a different life. Like um, I realized recently that it's now like I've been doing this for more than half of my life, which kind of feels like a long time. <laughs> I mean, I, um, yeah, it was in 2008. And I was 13. And so, yeah, things were very different then. Um, yeah, I saw Poi like on a kind of a school event, you know. I was actually directing a little theater show. <laughs> I was I mean, kind of like directing, you know, like directing in a way that you can direct something when you're 13. <laughs> and I saw these like older, older kids doing some LD Poi something. And um, I saw it and I was like, wow, this is so cool. I really want to try this. Um, and I tried it. And this there was this like guy... Was, a, was like a guy and a girl and the guy like didn't really want to like show me many things and um so he didn't want to like borrow me his poi and uh so i made my own poi like out of headphones <laughs> like earphones and uh, i spun them around and i learned like the tribute weave forwards and i think backwards probably bleed this the first day or something like that like just really <laughs> try like and yeah i mean i kind of like really fell in love with that thing and but i think like there are multiple beginnings of when you start doing something like that was the like the physical start when I discovered that this thing exists. It was only like a year later where when uh, I also looked up Poi on YouTube. And that's, I guess, when I when like something else than just the activity of spinning something started for me. Like I, I've seen there is a scene like out there and there are people with lifestyles and that I've never seen before and traveling to places that I wish I could travel. And I, I've seen this whole thing. And I got introduced like to the heroes of that time, right? So I like totally became that kid that's like looking, you know, like at all these like boy stars of the time and um, following everything. And yeah, I totally fell, fell in love with Nick Wussi as many other people have. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I was like 14 and I just, I like copied everything, what this guy was doing. I like learned everything from his tutorials and I like, started like taking the same kind of pens, you know, and like, <laughs> it's like people at that time <laughs> bring me like the little Nick that I just like thought, wow, this cool, this guy's cool. So I want to be cool too. So I'm just going to do like everything that he's doing. <laughs> but you somehow know, it's, it's, it's funny. We have a very similar, like I, I was started in 2007. I was a, like a 10 year old. So it's a uh, very interesting. And I felt very, wow. yeah, I felt very, very similar um, in the same way because yeah, I was like on YouTube very much as well. And so, yeah, very funny. Um, but yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I just like, it, it really felt so mystical. Like the, the poet itself, like not just the tricks, but but like the whole the world that I've discovered, you know, like uh, I was looking for, I was like really kind of a, a fantasy dreamy kid, you know, like uh, always escaping to some of my own reality. Like, uh, and, and this showed me some kind of, alternative reality that I really enjoyed and um, it connected a lot with some of a kind of a idea of a lifestyle that I thought was really cool I saw those people like traveling together you know, all these like retreat places and hanging out in Bali and doing all those cool things and like somehow instantly I thought that this is like what I have to do 
and there was like no questioning it just landed on me as like that <laughs> you know like uh, it was <laughs> here and yeah you know when you're 14 or 15 you're like you don't really think much about your future you're just like crazy about something and just want to go that direction and my parents thought like he's just gonna stop doing that like you know next month or something <laughs> yeah. never thought that i actually keep keep it for like the next 15 years and uh, actually really enter that kind of lifestyle but yeah i mean that was kind of about that was that was the early times and so and you mentioned um nick a little bit who who were some other uh, you know, spinners that you were kind of watching during that time? Like, did you did you run into like Surreal or like any of the other kind of like early, early spinners that were on YouTube? Mm. Yeah, I've seen like videos of, like, I mean, I watched a lot of Nick's videos. So whoever was like, um, you know, his videos or featured in mm -hmm. his videos, I got introduced to that through his videos. Then I slowly started like finding more and more stuff. Um, I... I've seen videos with Ronan and I've seen Utah's stuff and Ellie and John. Yeah. And, yeah. and like, um, I wasn't, yeah, I, I didn't know much about like the tech scene, like the, the Vulcan stuff. And I haven't mm -hmm. followed like the whole boy things. And I was a bit out of that. Yeah. I basically just knew YouTube and, um, same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same. Um, and it's funny how much this podcast has already talked about Nick, but I mean, for anybody that started around that time period, kind of the late 2000s uh, slash like early 2010s, yeah. I mean, Nick was just kind of the guy back then um, for yeah, you know, yeah, tutorials yeah. and yeah. So um, yeah, even as you did like some like kind of godly superpowers to him. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I know seriously. I was convinced yeah, I that this guy's like sewing his own pants. So I bought a sewing machine. <laughs> and I started sewing my own pants, you know. And then when I met him, like I grew up a bit and I maybe got a bit more um, <laughs> like rational about things. <laughs> like, were you ever like sewing your own pants? He's like, nope. And I ah, really <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what you did. So I like thought I have to do the same. And I bought the swing machine and I like did my own clothes and all this stuff, like belly bells, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Like I was just totally crazy about this stuff. And yeah, I mean, then in my sort of evolution, I guess there was a point in which so like, I, I think I spent like three years or something, like just kind of copying Nick and like being like just um yeah, not finding my own self within. Mm -hmm. within this art form mm -hmm. i was like to, to start performing when i was already 15 as i was invited by pyrotera the czech group to, to join them for like a czech's got talent show and oh, wow. this way i actually got to, to start performing like very early and i kind of stayed so i got into this project with them and i stayed in that group and i started kind of regularly performing and that opened a lot of doors of like finding my own style and as I was growing older, like my nothing changed about my inspirations that I got thanks to being exposed to this lifestyle that I've discovered thanks to Nick and all these videos. So I just, as soon as I could travel, I started traveling and like, yeah, subconsciously like going towards the same, the same goal. And I haven't changed st still now, you know, like I feel like I was just exposed to so much inspiration back then that I can, can't mm -hmm. ever get rid of that. <laughs> and um, even today I'm like subconsciously want to like do retreats and travel to exotic places and all that stuff. But when I actually started traveling, that's when I would say it was like the next start of this, of this story. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And I could see why you kind of gravitated towards Nick and took a lot of inspiration from him because he was very much already doing the thing back then as far as traveling and, and had, you know, very much involved on, I mean, that kind of was his life was performing and traveling and teaching. So yeah, you've very much emulated a lot of uh, his successes in your own ways. Um, and so we kind of already talked about your, your early inspirations um, and the way that's, that you were able to use that inspiration and apply it to your own life moving forward. Um, so let's let's get into the the retreat side of things. You have you've been very successful with uh, retreats uh, in multiple places, events, um, and so tell us a little bit about uh, how this mm. started and and how in the ways that it's grown over the years. Yeah, yeah, it relates to like this moment when I started traveling, and like I said, I was just I thought that's like. What I should do, like to do retreats one day, and uh, I guess I. It took me time to realize if I'm ready to to start doing that. I was never feeling like I'm quite ready, but there was a very important point in my life, uh, in uh, like 2013, when uh, that was kind of when I finally became 18, <laughs> and I could like travel, you know, and um, somehow I, 
I ended up in this island of Stromboli in in Italy, this beautiful volcanic island where now I'm doing retreats and I lo love coming back to there. And there, there, there was this festival, Festival of Fuoco di Stromboli. It was a very unique thing that, um, yeah, meant a lot for me. It did a lot for me back then because I, it was like an, it wasn't really a festival. It was more like artist gathering and like, there was this amazing guy who just wanted to bring the best fire dancers in the world to that festival and mm. facilitate like two weeks of creating things together with music that was like rising appalachia as, as a band one year when i was there for the first time and so on so it was like a lot of musicians a lot of artists some theater people like 60 crazy artists like all of them being very good in what they're doing on a volcanic volcanic island doing like crazy stuff for two weeks and creating beautiful things and um it was only like for people that are invited but i somehow i had a friend who kind of said like yeah you're not really invited but i think it'll be okay like just come you know and we'll see how it goes and i i came there like kind of super shy and i was there and i saw like all those people that i've been seeing on on youtube or something and uh, yeah i was like as shy as someone can be <laughs> and plus i wasn't invited and like wasn't eating because i knew like the food was not made for me there's like specific amount of, like it's really sort of uh, just staying in the back and then i was invited like by, by the organizer to actually perform and um I, I feel like that performance which is still somewhere on youtube on my channel like from 2013 that really like changed everything because the people like those artists and everyone like so saw me and they're like who's this kid like he's good with poi and suddenly like i was kind of invited to be part of the thing like and uh, kind of valued in a way you know and it was amazing you know like i came like um, a random kid like super shy who nobody knew and i felt like i left uh, as an artist ah. in a way like, and so this initiation to that meant so much for me and like being exposed to this these people and sort of activity like being on an island with artists and doing all this artistic stuff when i was 18 <laughs> that was really, like a breakthrough moment for me and yeah, since then, I, I kind of like realized, all right, so I'm on the journey. Like this is happening, you know, like uh, I, now I know the people and I hopefully can be part of this this community and like get my place there. And I kept on coming back to the island. But unfortunately, in um, after the 2014 edition, so that was not very late after that, the, the organizer um, had an accident, fell in a coma and eventually died in 2015. So that story like changed and transformed. Mm -hmm. The festival still happened in 2016 and 2018 without the main organizer, organized by his friends and the local community in the island. But eventually this kind of faded, faded out. And um, yeah, I just felt like there's room to, to keep bringing some, something to this island. And um, yeah, I did my first retreat there actually in 2016 and it was my, my friend Srikanta with who we also traveled to this festival and um, hanged out a lot. Like he invited me to teach with him in a retreat that like, or like kind of do a retreat together in Stromboli. He actually already did one there with, without me before. And it was like, wait, I know you want to do retreats and I think you're ready. Like, let's do it together. You're going to have your like own week of teaching poi. And I do week of teaching staff and uh, let's do it. You know, I was like, really? You sure? You know, like <laughs> I felt like I'm not old enough or experienced enough or something he really encouraged me so it was like 2016 i think when i when i did this for the first time and uh yeah in encouraged me a lot because i realized that uh, yeah i know enough to to be able to pass some things on and um like i'm able to organize something as i've also started like organizing things before yeah. that a little bit so i felt like okay i'm ready and i um, was very thankful for shrikanta's encouragement then and so yeah like two years later i thought it would be great to to have Ronan as part of this project, who is a very <laughs> nice. someone I really admire and um, a good friend too. And uh, he joined and ever since we've been doing it together. It was actually maybe already 2017. Yeah, well, well, we just finished doing this retreat 10 days ago and we realized it was the sixth one with Ronan. Wow. So, or maybe fifth, yeah. Anyway, ever since we're doing this with Ronan and uh, I so much enjoy teaching alongside this guy. It's really big inspiration for me. And uh, as, a, as a boy artist, and as a human too, so right. that's something I appreciate. And Ronan, Ronan is, um, yeah, I mean, just an incredible artist. I mean, on many fronts. Those of you who know who he is, um, know how much I respect him. Or you know, the people that have been watching the podcast, Ronan spearheaded the contact poi um, movement essentially in a lot of ways. 
Yeah. Um, and, and truly, truly an inspiration for me early on as well. So, um, yeah, what a beautiful story, man. Your, your, uh, <laughs> the ways that that happened and the whole, it, how it transpired into what it is now and how involved you are in the retreat. Um, you know, in what, what ways do you think you've, you've kind of changed it or what ways has it grown over the years? Has it remained like kind of the same or did you just making minor oh, modifications? It, it changed a lot. Yeah. I mean, after doing this retreat, I've also met, um, this girl, Nana, who became my partner in, in this project, who, who wanted to organize a retreat in a beautiful castle in France. And, um, she came to my workshop and she liked the way I teach and spin and everything. So she invited me to, to, to teach and she like on this first like experimental retreat in a, in a castle where she was working as a manager. That was also like 2017 or something. And um, yeah, it was great. Like we did, did this retreat in a like, French castle and it was awesome. And uh, um, we realized that um, she's got some skills that, that I don't have. I have some skills that she doesn't have. We can work together and kind of, I asked her, do you want to like join doing the Stromboli retreat with me? Like, do you want to help with some of this administration? And like, she made a website. She, she, yeah. So it turned out like a perfect partnership. And I'm very thankful for that because it's really also thanks to her that now we're where we're at as mm -hmm. um, she's doing a lot of like all the things that I'm not so good at, like handling some finances or doing like some Google sheets and stuff like, and um, doing a lot of website stuff. And um, I kind of like designed the whole thing and I, I find the space and I come, I make the concept, I made the program and like design the thing. And, and she's like really doing some, some hard work that I, would it take me time to learn to do? And I wouldn't yeah. have time to actually do the things that um, I feel like I should be doing, which is more like, yeah, finding those spaces and like focusing on the program and, sure. and like the artistic side of it. So yeah, now we've done 16 retreats or 17 maybe together wow. like for a year together and we have sort of a system that works and uh, i'm incredibly thankful for the sustainability that i've discovered within that because yeah that's something i really value about 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 things it's like it's easy to get super enthusiastic about something and just like do it once you know you can always like excite some people excite yourself enough to like take make some project and do it once or twice twice but the, to keep that thing going on for like for a long time to mm -hmm. find like the patterns that works where the inspiration and motivation is constant and challenges can be you know work, worked out and um, yeah where you're just enjoying what you're doing a long time it's not just like get excited about something and then you leave it right this happens a lot like it helped to me too like getting excited about something like now i'm gonna do this you know and then like two months <laughs> later like yeah let's do that <laughs> you know? yeah. So, yeah 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 it's, it's something i'm thinking a lot in everything i'm doing and for instance this poetry treat project uh, is um yeah something that turned out to be sustainable and exciting in long term and now we're doing also yeah this retreat in guatemala which Already first edition was like sold out <laughs> without even having materials for like for promoting it. So we had to like, you know, like steal uh, material from like Shutterstock or something. <laughs> <laughs> like to, to throw that in. And uh, it got sold out. And second year it got sold out like in two or three weeks again. And uh, yeah, it just happened. And I'm unbelievable. And I'm like, Damn, that's amazing. It goes and to show how, like, how much. Yeah, work. a lot of like my own enthusiasm has has contributed to that and um yeah of course of course yeah and it just goes to show how much um work you know you've you've taken from your your you know events and your retreats that you did originally and just applied it to to guatemala and italy um it's such a beautiful thing that you're doing and uh i was gonna say on the collaborative part um in a lot of ways that you you couldn't have done the the project without her i mean even just for myself i couldn't do the podcast without joey um and he yeah. he knows a lot of the tech side of things and like i have no idea what i'm doing on on that front so yeah it really does take combining your efforts if you're trying to make a project worth it and you're trying to make it happen it takes people that have different skill sets and different totally, yeah. things that they can apply to the project so so great that you've had people that have been you know filling in you know your shortcomings or your like lack of knowledge on some things like we really need people to support us yeah, um, totally I'm, i yeah. feel like i've been i i have to thank a lot or i have to thank for so much for like many people that i've m met in my journey that really helped me like to 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 get me somewhere and uh yeah mm -hmm. like 
I've been reminded by, by my friends like wow you're really lucky about like the people you're meeting and like what people decide to to do for you and it, this is really true like I've been incredibly lucky with having met the right people at the right time and um yeah and in the end you know I mean I feel like it's really going down to my enthusiasm about poi because like when I as long as I was st stick to to poi and just like try to follow you know what I feel where it takes me it always took me the right way mm -hmm. even if it, like yeah I mean, I just always like follow, follow those balls and strings, right? And uh, yeah, it took me always the right way. And even to like areas where that have nothing to do with, with Poi anymore, you know, like thanks to that, I, because I was really into like videography and stuff, like it took me into that department too. And I, I like started to be more serious about shooting and editing and videography in general. And I've then been, yeah, like experienced some really cool things and being able to create with some people or, shoot things that are great and again like that's because of poi you know like mm -hmm. i just follow the instinct of like where it was taking me and it took me to various directions even outside of poi and yeah i'm thankful for that a lot yeah so it was so great so great and so i was actually on that subject you're a very multi uh, multi-talented uh multi-faceted individual so tell us a little bit i mean you're also a a traveling musician are you not um not really a traveling musician <laughs> uh, i'm traveling when i'm not a musician yeah <laughs> so uh yeah i mean i do a lot of music i grew up in a music family my both uh, parents being mu music teachers i started playing drums 20 years ago <laughs> damn that's so long ago like when i was eight and um yeah i mean i studied jazz conservatory you know and i studied music like started doing music way before poi and so it's always been part of my life somehow and yeah, actually, I'm, I'm do a bunch of music. I have a my band uh, that uh, we started with my friends like seven years ago. And I also thought seven years ago that I would be unable to actually keep that project up with having already like quite a solid life in um ah oh, yeah that's, that's music clip um, in Poi. And again, I managed to we managed to find sustainability there even when I'm like traveling a lot. So. Yeah, I really enjoy like doing something else than Poi too, you know. I, I feel like if I was just doing Poi, um, it would be easy to burn out or lose passion. And um, I'm, I really enjoy going between different worlds. So like my band T grew in, in Czech now, like we have quite good gigs. It's getting quite serious. And we just recently yeah. were invited to play alongside with like Eric Trufaz in Athens Jazz Festival and stuff. And it's really growing somewhere and it's really amazing. So I love this like thing that I come from a show from or a retreat to Prague and uh, I'm going straight behind drums to play with my band. And yeah, like switching between two those worlds. I really enjoy it. It is Incredible. challenging and the band's suffering with my yeah, lack of presence in Prague. But there is a, like a replacement drummer that plays the gigs when I'm not there, which essentially is like half of the time <laughs> and that, that's likely working out and i also love to compose my own music i've been learning a lot about music production and i'm trying to combine with, with performing too so like making stunt tracks and effects and, and things and yeah <laughs> man yeah you were like i was like oh you're a, you know you're a traveling musician and you're like oh not quite but i'm like yo he's underplaying this shit he's in a in, in a band that does ridiculous shows <laughs> yeah. you do insane gigs I, I caught some footage of a of a show you did recently and i was i was blown away y'all do yeah, a lot of shit out there it's pretty cool so good like you know it, i mean this is a different for uh, form of like satisfaction that you have from playing concerts you know like doing a show like you can really touch someone you can like make someone cry you can like yeah go to the audience go crazy and so on but like playing like an hour long concert where the people are like dancing like mad and you know the whole like thousands of people like jumping up and down in front of you. That's something that you like, I don't get to experience in, in performing. And uh, I fucking mm -hmm. love that. Mm -hmm. like, and my band, I love these guys too. Like we're just have a lot of humor in what we're doing. <laughs> we're not like taking ourselves too seriously, as you can see, like this whole eat human to make the planet a better place thing. I mean, that's really. <laughs> <laughs> so in what, what language are y'all primarily speaking here? Um, this is all in English. The, this Is it really? Clip. Yeah. So, and then, but what, but what's like the primary language? Cause like, was English your first language or do you, did y'all like, no, I, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm from Czech. I speak Czech. Yeah, <laughs> and, and English. Yeah, yeah, so and then like, cool, dude. yeah, I also made this video clip. So, like I said, like videography has been like a big um, part of my my um, yeah um, endeavors. <laughs> so, like, I've been filming and like editing a bunch of music clips and dance clips and things. And so yeah, <laughs> so cool, so cool. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad we got to touch on that a little bit. Um, and your your you know music um, endeavors as well as your poi and teaching endeavors have kind of accumulated a little bit into the. Will you? I can't. Every every time I hear this, I cannot. I can never pronounce it correctly. Will you pronounce it for me? What is it called? I just love when people mispronounce it. <laughs> So I want you to try, man. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, go on. Just okay, all right, all okay. right. I'm gonna I'm gonna imitate Cassie Cassie here. So she said, "Rush talk, rush talk." Oh, is that right? <laughs> Close. Okay, okay. Oh man, yeah. Well, people say rush touch or rush talk or rush or basically anything starting with raw. I I usually know that they're talking about this. <laughs> yeah, it's rush touch. I kind of wish I haven't chosen that name back then uh the festival yeah but uh i didn't know it was, would be a festival <laughs> it was my birthday party <laughs> <laughs> like we just had this access to this like big indoor hall where we used to practice with my friend and we just decided like let's i thought like i would make just a really crazy birthday party where people would be also spinning fire indoors <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah it just turned out to be like one night with like some, one band and uh, DJs and Firespace. And uh, then I did it again. And yeah, it turned out to be like kind of a, I guess, probably the second biggest fire festival in Europe. Dude, you're uh, fucking wild. You start off, you're like, yeah, I just have a birthday party. And then it turns into the second be biggest floor festival in Europe. That's fucking insane, man. That happens then when you're just, yeah, going towards things. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sometimes it's... it's I, I just sometimes don't know like where to stop. I just like feel like things have to grow and they have to become bi bigger and better. And honestly, I'm also discovering now later in life that that's not always the best way to go. You know, like this year, this festival, like this is what you're seeing is from last year, which was already big, really big with symbolical playing and stuff, you know. But this year is like even twice as big. And I'm like, holy okay, shit. Like, um, stay with the feet on the ground. Yeah, it's, it's getting serious. Like, a lot of money involved and potential like John Sue, yeah. my boy. <laughs> Shout out to John Sue. Hell yeah. Yeah. Fucking beautiful, man. And you you're getting incredible jugglers, uh stick jugglers. I mean, you, you musicians, so many talented individuals. I really I love yeah. what you're doing. Um yeah, I hear well, great I hear know, great like, things. Thanks. Yeah, like if you want to know what's kind of like my artistic intention with this festival. Like, as you can see from this video, I really like to bring different art forms on one place. And I want like to facilitate sort of like cross inspiration and cross validation between different art forms. And I want also fire dancing to stand out as something really worthwhile and uh, like uh, something that, yeah, can be important on a festival too, you know? And yeah. yeah, so like music is a big focus in this festival for sure. And I also love when like, Amazing jugglers, amazing fire dancers come to, to a festival where there's such a good music that none of them jugglers or spins anything and they're just dancing the whole time. <laughs> and like <laughs> that happens, I'm like, goal achieved, you know. <laughs> like That's so I cool, want man. all of us to like celebrate all the other art forms and and get inspired from different art forms too. You know, I think there's so much that we as fire dancers have to learn from circus and circus artists have to learn from us and and um from music and ah. yeah it's ex there we have like exhibitions of different art and yeah i like the format of it like i don't like when there's like the artist and the participants so i just want like that messy mix of all artists in one place where everyone kind of does what they do all together and share and just love the contrast you know so we've had some like traditional polka dancers and followed by like a psytrance dj you know and then <laughs> Like I just love the weird uncombinable combinations of things. Yeah. When we really come down to is it, like, yeah, like there's so much that connects people with different endeavors, and we can all just really celebrate that and have fun at one place. And yeah, 
That's I, I am I am a little <laughs> taken I am a little taken back by by just the the inspiration and um yeah I mean seriously you're getting incredible work I'm very honored to to just be here sitting here t- chatting with you about it there's a great just... team of people behind me also who've been incredibly supportive and um yeah I'm thankful that like we haven't fell apart in the last 10 years because many festivals I'd say like majority of festivals unfortunately kind of falls apart after a few years of Doing that, I mean, here, yeah, mm-hmm. United States, I've seen quite incredible, um, yeah, like festivals have been repetitively happening sure. for many years. Sure. Yeah, I've seen like a lot of festivals in Europe and in Czech Republic, particularly to like rise and like disappear just like a few years later. So, and then on on this topic of combining contemporary circus artists and jugglers and all kinds of different artists, there is some, you know, underlying cultural differences between behind like what you would refer to as like flow arts versus you know the european scene which is more geared towards again like circus um juggling so what do you think are the biggest differences and and how has that kind of impacted and how have you been able to integrate them with with such um you know uh like smoothness and and just talk a little bit about about that like performance versus Mm -hmm. hobby us versus europe Mm, yeah, this is such a big topic, right? And it really depends like what end you're taking this from and like, yeah, on what sub-subject of, of the, this subject we're talking, right? I mean, indeed, uh, there's a um, difference between, I think, like the division of, the, of those different art forms in Europe and the United States and other parts of the world. Um, I think in Europe the really contributing factor is that juggling and circus is a very old art form, which made it to become like really official in some way. And um, I see a lot of like parallels between that and uh, some music, um, music like genres and um, cultures like jazz, for instance, you know, like so I studied on a jazz university, a jazz conservatory, which like, and honestly, like I was like the hippie there, you know, and like, even like listening other things than jazz and like listening to electronic music. And I was really kind of a outcast in a way, <laughs> like uh, kind of the weird guy that like, and there was like a lot of this kind of music elitism there because jazz is a very serious art form, you know, it's like, mm. the, uh, you know, and it's complicated. <laughs> like, and you have to know all this and you have to do it this way. And that's not jazz. This is jazz and you know, all this stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, I got quite traumatized and took me quite a few years to, to be able to say that I'm a musician without kind of feeling uh, meaningless in some way, because, um, yeah, I also didn't, I wasn't like studying it as much as uh, other, I mean, I was also doing other things. So it was quite mm-hmm. rare. Anyway, what I want to say is that jazz in the early stage of, of this music art form was um, a total underground kind of thing, right? Like it just uh, developed in bars and like jazz music- musicians were looked at kind of drug addicts, alcoholists, like just as maybe in some circus elites, some fire spinners are. And today it's like the thing, you know, that you can study and like, yeah. And um, I think it's kind of similar maybe with some contemporary circus in Europe because it upgraded into like a field which is very official and defined in a way. So that changes a lot, I think, in Europe for sometimes understandable reasons. I mean, like younger art forms just has explored yet and maybe there's like less good stuff that you're seeing than in a very well-developed art forms. So let's say if you ask like a random person on the street, like, oh, have you seen fire dancing? What do you think about it? And they say, yeah, I've seen it in Thailand on the beach. You know, I've seen like, or this basking show over there. Like, again, like a story from my kind of student years, like talking to my teacher, like, who asked me, like, what is this thing that you're doing? I'm like, yeah, I spin those like boy, you know, it's like balls and strings. It's like, oh yeah, I've seen this girl like at the entrance to the Metro, like, yeah, she was good. And uh, I know which girl he was talking about. It was like a homeless girl spinning poi, like not really spinning, but, and I was like, <laughs> man, yeah, like that's not exactly like what I'm doing, <laughs> but I, I understand why that happens because like that's, it's harder to see like something really developed and let's say good when, the art form is new right where like yeah in music like you have like homeless musicians doing something or you have like bad music you know and stuff but when you say music like you think about all the good things that you've came across because you 
typically came across some good things, right? Mm -hmm. Like some kind of high level things. And uh, in this art form, like people, most the chances are that it's just seen something kind of very simple. So um, yeah, and like circus, because like if you say circus, some people in Europe, like they've seen it in a TV, you know, they've they had a chance to go to see a show and we don't really have that yet with fire dancing. So that's why there is like a, sometimes a presumption that this is something less, but it's really just a presumption. And I think it really goes down to like how you're thinking about it um, in terms of like what the general public thinks about it. And that, that's really this point of view that I'm talking about now. And like, if I'm asked like what I'm doing, I'd rather say that I'm a juggler or a visual performer or a circus artist, just because I feel like it's the only way that someone can actually understand what I'm doing. And I also like, Thing that yeah when you're bringing like poi or flow arts on stage it becomes some performance sort of um art form right like for me the term flow arts kind of uh resonates with like the the hobby or the the sort of like non-performative uh part of the thing in some way you know like um yeah yeah if you know what i mean like yeah um, sure i get you i get what you're saying um and so about the cultural differences, like when you started coming over to the United States, how how different do you think a lot of the approaches are about some of the flow arts festivals in um, in the U.S. compared to some of the like retreats or the, you know, I want to say like flow arts festivals in Europe? What do you think there are the main differences, if any? Um, Honestly, depends. You guys have, I think, uh, actually more festivals and the community is more connected than uh, than in Europe just for the fact that United States is one country made of many mm-hmm. states and Europe is like many different countries and you don't suffer from language barrier while <laughs> we do greatly you know? <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah, speak English. <laughs> yeah <Stuff> absolutely <laughs> so that contributes to like uh, the community not being as um, yeah glued together I guess but um, yeah I, I don't know, like, I, I love seeing, like, more juggling and circus incorporated in events in Europe. Because in the end, it's, like, we love the same thing, right? We lo- I mean, we love to do this this thing at the same sort of event or, like, um, yeah. So, yeah, but I don't see, like, that big differences. There's, there's nothing that really comes to my mind. You know, but- and, and the thing is, though, that there's, this, this has been a very, you know, um, weighed in on discussion, you could say, over the last uh, couple months. And my biggest thing is, yes, there are differences behind jugglers and poi spinners. But at the end of the day, like we're kind of doing the same thing in a sense. Like we're w- uh, your medium is different than my medium, but we're we have kind of the same goal in a sense. And we we do it for yeah. a similar reason. And I think like the things that again, I've said this before, but the the commonalities behind jugglers and poi spinners or however you want to call it, we have so much more in common than we do differences. And I think um, it's very worth like there's a reason that they're starting to happen at the same events where you'll have an incredible ball juggler or club juggler that will be, you know, followed up or on stage by, um, you know, different, different um, mm. acts that are very different. And, but they're kind of all under the same umbrella, I would say, because yeah, again, I think it, it depends similar. really, I think it really depends like on the point of view, like from the performance point of view, you know, like also what, what like people who hire finances, what they want to see is, sort of entertainment and um like we use fire we use fire effects we use fancy costumes and fireworks and and sparkles you know and stuff and um in the eyes of like or like looking at it as or, or and let's compare that with like some kind of contemporary circus in europe for instance yeah like it unpacks it takes out like every kind of unnecessary layer of the art form until it hits the real core of what there is so you like if you see a kind of a contemporary circus or let's say contemporary juggling show, like often like no costume, no effects, you know, sometimes not even any music. Like there is the plain focus on like the thing itself that you're doing. And um, of course, so from that perspective, if this is like what you're, that's the, the place where you are and that's what you're doing, what we're doing, <laughs> I mean, I'm saying we're, but yeah, I mean, what fire dancers are doing is um, yeah, like we're using a lot of things that can make the show very shiny and like puts it a little bit more in the entertainment area because of using effects. 
And um, yeah, but we're often doing that because that's how we find job, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, also we're doing that because we like it and that's completely fine. However, I, yeah, I mean, I do understand both, both perspectives and I also by time like lean towards that simplicity because I just feel like, yeah, I don't want to like, I don't want to say hide, but I just feel like if I manage to do a show which is has something which is not based on any effects, not even fire, even though like, yeah, and performing with fire is incredibly difficult, which like those people actually don't realize, you know, like the fire point just never weighed the same throughout the whole thing. You know, it's like, yes. you it. there are so many aspects why actually doing like a fire point act is really, really hard. But still, I also feel inspired by exploring that plain, simple area where, yeah, but there's no effects. But I also really enjoy doing the effects too, you know. So watching like, watching yeah. your performance at Kindle um was probably my favorite performance I've ever seen live um from anybody. Um and you had I just loved the simplistic I say simplistic as in like you're wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt and like it's yeah. just very true to you know your your journey and like the humble beginnings and the again the simplicity of there's no big fire, you know, um, explosives or whatever kind of crazy stuff that we're doing nowadays. It was just very true to the art and it was very, um, it was, it was fucking incredible, man. So as far as your, I, I do want to touch on, on performance and the way that you build your choreography. How long did that act take you to build? I know that's kind of a hard question, but hmm. you know, like, how did you build that? Well, I, that was one, one of my goals that turned out to be incredibly hard to achieve <laughs> to actually make a choreography with Poi, you know, like I, I used to be really like, like Poi spinning was kind of a, like the, the flow aspect of it has been really the priority. And uh, like there was a time when I was like very stubborn in, in this. And like, I just, I, I, I felt like what I'm doing on stage should always reflect the moment and my momental in the current inspiration. And I've always like, Tend to, tended to pick music at the last moment and so on because yeah there is something that like you can sometimes make a very special performance when when it's improvised when it's like kind of like you you feel where you are you feel the energy and you respond to it and i think that's something that's impossible to achieve with a choreography actually and i'm really enjoying doing that still like all the all my firepoy videos are basically that you know, like I never did, except for my act at the EJC. It was the first time I did a choreographed fire poi act. But before, I always went this way. But then, you know, like there are the highlights when you're like doing, when you're really in the flow and everything's, like you really feel the moment and you feel space, you know, and like the space to, to, to express the things you want to express. And the track is good and everything. And then there are the moments when it's not that, you know. And uh, after a few times when, when you just feel like you've done something quite crappy and you're not really happy with it. I mean, I'm usually kind of not happy with what I do. I tend to be quite um, yeah, critical towards myself. But yeah, I just felt like, no, I want to make an act where I'm just going to really, I want to show things and I, that I always forget to do, you know. And mm -hmm. so there's no other way than just making a uh, choreography. And I remember like talking to Antti Sunia, this amazing um, staff juggler from Finland who sort of retired from staff juggling but has been like really the staff juggling hero of, uh, of like yeah, 10 years ago and he told me like you want to make a really good juggling act or like really good poet thing or staff thing like you have to make a horror man and then you don't drop and you do all the things you do and uh, like, I was like yeah you're right and I, I knew that one day I want to make it and I found it so difficult I, I felt like I need a concept and uh, I discovered that kind of Bluetooth speaker weird <laughs> concept a little bit. And yeah, but anyway, like for I was building some sequences for like two years. And I knew that like when I find a concept or find a song or find, find something to embed it into, I'll have those sequences. So I was working on different sequences that I had. And then when I found a concept, I tried to use those sequences in to make this horror. And um, yeah, often like was the difficulty of finding the connection between the sequences that led to some really interesting creation. Like when mm. you're, you have a sequence that ends in one way, like weird way, like both boy on one side, like 
in a weird position. And then you have like another sequence that's like on a completely different position. And so you're trying to find a, a connection between the two. And that has turned out to be some of the most interesting research that I've ever been through. Like, yeah, taking like two things that are hard to combine and finding like different ways of combining. And usually I would find like 10 of them. I would record, record all 10 of them and I would wait which one feels the best. And sometimes it would give me a whole new idea that would lead to like a whole new part, you know, of the hurdle. Wow. And um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it very much did. That's, uh, yeah, incredible insight because I, I saw the performance and I really just got motivated to, to try to just start creating, you know, an actual, an act, a choreography. Um, and I, I build sequences pretty, you know, every week for, for videos and stuff like that. So I find um, very similar things. And you're saying that I, I have this one thing that I want to do. And then this other thing that I want to do and finding how to con connect them, you come across some very interesting transitions. Um, but you even taking the next step to find 10 different ones and be like, okay, which one do I like the best? I really am going to start trying to do a similar uh, approach towards a lot of the things that, that I'm trying mm -hmm. to do. Because a lot of the times I come up with some weird, funky stuff and I have the transition where I'm like, could have been a little bit more smoothed out, could have been a little bit more aesthetic, um, you know, whatever, whatever it could be. So, yeah, that was a, a great insight on that. And y'all yeah. have to catch this man performing at some point because holy fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there's one thing I can add to that, just like that this it was the first time that like for me, a music has been always like the leading element in in what I call like f the flow, you know, like, um, yeah, without music, I would never be able to like do anything with poet before, <laughs> like any act or not even like, you know, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, this act was like when I said like, yeah, so I've been exploring this for a long time, like finding the inspiration in music. And what is it like if I take it from the other end, if I don't, if I don't care about music, I will just care about the moves. And will not allow the music to sort of restrict me. And yeah, that, that was an interesting like change. And maybe for someone who is on that side, not caring about music much, maybe exploring the other, other end of like really just going, that's the music, what I do with that can be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Taking different approaches to try to come to, to a goal that's unique and special to, to who you are as an artist. Um, I do want to transition into a new topic. Let's watch. I, I sent you, <laughs> I sent you a question. And I was like, "What are your two like favorite videos that that you could have uh, point to as far as um, like a poi video on YouTube?" You sent me four. Which one do yeah. you want to watch, sir? We Honestly, have... it's difficult to say what are my favorite, like two <laughs> favorite poi videos. I know. Like, it, videos I know. Back in the day, meant a lot to me and I watched them 150 times and I'm still very happy to watch them again. I sent you, yeah, those four, um, yeah, like for different reasons. I think some of them like um, kind of, ex they represent some kind of poi style or uh, yeah, let's say poi style or style of exploration that I think uh, I don't see so much these days. And I think it's a pity because there's so much from that that uh, we can explore. And I, of course, sent Serial's Melting Poi because I think that's like, a, this video will never get like boring. It's like, no, I've watched it maybe, um, I don't know, like every two or three years once, you know? And I every time I see a different thing, you know, like as I'm progressing through my Poi journey, yes. and although I feel like I'm exploring naturally some of the things that Serial was exploring back, back then by myself. Yeah. I, like, I, oh, I, yeah. I, oh, that's it. I was, I was chatting with, with Bo about this. Um, I was chatting oh, with Bo about this and he, he was talking about two poi spinning and surreal. And he said, yeah, like back then when I was kind of, you know, getting into poi, I, a lot of this stuff just went over my head completely and I didn't understand, like, I just wasn't really, I didn't have the eye yet to actually see what he was doing. Yeah, so I think it's absolutely. very important yeah. to come back to these videos um, and give it, extra attention after you have you know progressed and you are more uh confident in in what you're doing you see it in a different way and you're like oh that's what he was doing that's the area that he was on like it's yeah. so it just yeah, changes exactly. over time yeah it's very beautiful yeah totally totally yeah and i really remember it f seeing it for the first time and i really didn't understand much about what's going on 
And uh, like, I just watched it for, for the sake of sending you those videos yesterday. And I feel like I finally understand what, what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, uh, that was good. And yeah, there's so many things that I have naturally came to explore myself. But back, back then, I was just on a completely different, like on a different path. And uh, yeah, it's amazing seeing that again. So yeah, I think this video is just stands for like, what is there really with Poi celebrating all the aspects of this prop? Like taking inspiration from Poi itself, not so much from a different prop, you know? Like um, mm -hmm. not translating club tricks into Poi, but taking Poi tricks coming from the physical kinetic aspects of this prop and doing the maximum with it. And so, yeah, th this is just great in my opinion. Like, <laughs> it's a it's an absolute timeless classic um i was I very happy that you sent me yeah this is another video um you know and it's it, for its own ways is significant uh, i'm glad that you sent me this as well uh remind me who who's the artist featured here thomas johansson mm. also known as neviso i mean it was very famous boy spinner here in europe uh yeah some back in the day like one of the you know big names uh yes yeah, great guy met him several times and um yeah i haven't even really watched this video yesterday when i was sending it to you but his style is something that is can be very inspiring for people these days like there is so much in terms of like cleanness of timing mm -hmm. and like plane control and transitions between things with some kind of simple moves that people take for granted like i ah, yeah, we've seen that like you, you know this is kind of boring like today we do different things sure There's so much you know that we're like I, I've see, I, I think that often people kind of mess up from this simple style and yeah I just love the, the simplicity and beauty of the transitions within the timing and celebrating like yeah the point geometry which for me is just constantly amazing me like I keep discovering new things all the time or understanding old things with a new perspectives. Yes, yes. And I have dove into some of your videos um, fairly recently, recently actually, um, going over new concepts that you've discovered and you're applying them in, in ways that are very unique. Um, so yeah, you, you really do have a very like grid-based approach. And I was shocked uh, to see such a like an insightful um, like pr presentation of these new ideas uh, that you've delivered, like specifically on, on the, uh, the eights. I think mm -hmm. they're just doing um, incredible work on that. So I, I think, um, and you know, it's funny is I, I've, there's this guy in my local area that got really excited about this idea um, because I mm -hmm. showed it to him and I broke it down for him. And then I showed him the video that you, you were breaking it down as well. And, and he's very like math oriented guy, like as far as mm -hmm. boy and the grid theory goes and everything. So, yeah, I think there's still so much room left to be discovered as far as pattern work goes. And I think you're just doing a, a great job, um, you know, incorporating yeah. some of these ideas. So very special. Yeah, yeah. I'm constantly inspired by those things. Like it's just never getting boring. And yeah, like, you know, sometimes it takes so many years to understand something so simple. And then when you actually really understand it, you're... You're, it's exciting and you can instantly like see how that applies to different things and so on like for me also having taught many workshops and so on really help to understand some really basic things and yeah like i really enjoy that i think there's that things by poi are poi and there's a like specific thing about poi spinning and the geometry and the timing that's really just in poi and then uh, yeah i'd love to see that more and i love to spread that kind of message uh, so and, and on, on that point it's incredible how detail oriented you are towards um, all the things that we just went over flowers, grid theory, everything like that. But you, you're also an incredible poi juggler and you have uh, gone very far into three poi and in that, that style as well. You were actually mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I, that I started um, spinning three poi. So how has the juggling journey been? How has the three poi journey been? What frustrations have you come across along the way? Oh, man. <laughs> so many but i guess like yeah like i said i used to be sort of like flow oriented like rarely practicing like a move over and over kind of guy um like yeah in the early times and i yeah i mean i've discovered some sort of peace and sort of like way of active meditation through just throwing things in the air you know mm -hmm. and uh, just like repeating something and yeah i guess one things worth mentioning is that actually for me juggling started with staffs like a uh, staff juggling is uh, equally 
exciting for me these days. Play it one more time. Play one more time. And um, yeah, so I, I think I started juggling staffs and I was like, wow, it's really fun to just also practice a move until you get it. You know, like that's a sort of simple, like um, simple goal oriented. Um, yeah, endeavor is great. Like you just do it until you stop dropping. And that was a new concept for me that I've discovered thanks to staff juggling. And then finally started juggling Poi 2 a little bit. And yeah, it's like, I love practicing. I it's like part of my day when, when it can be. And it's a way for me to forget about all my like <laughs> computer work and organizing things and so on. <laughs> and like, yeah, sometimes like you just want to turn your brain off and just like repeat a move, you know? Yeah. Really yeah. And th these, the Seb's messes and the, the, all these advanced juggling patterns that you're doing with Poi, I mean, they take so much time to learn. Yeah. Like anybody who, who knows had the struggle of juggling. Yeah, and um, you really want to know. like hang yourself on the Poi like million times during doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. So um, that's actually one of my favorite Poi clips. I mean, I, I absolutely love that. I mean, the, the place, the setting, what you're doing. Um, and let's talk about while we're on this video, to tell us where you're located in that video and why that's such a significant um, place to you. Oh, yeah, that's in Stromboli. And that's significant for the reasons I explained. Mm -hmm. I keep having mm -hmm. a bike to this rooftop. And um, this rooftop, yeah, I've seen a lot. Like when I arrived there, there was Linda Farkash playing with her kids on this rooftop, you know. So, <laughs> so beautiful. Oh, yeah. my gosh. And uh, yeah. yeah, I keep coming back there all the time. It's my favorite training place. Uh, the owner of the house which is a, a girlfriend of, of the guy who, who unfortunately passed away. Uh, we have a good relationship and it's just a special place. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah, I, I very much uh, love whenever you're posting there. So um, going on to a, a little bit of a new topic, um, kind of more more related to the concepts um, in, in more relation to like uh, poi moves and what inspires you, where's where's your focus headed right now? Like, what are you working on? Do you have anything like? Is it more three poi oriented? Is it more two poi oriented? Like, what mm -hmm. what are you excited about right now as far as poi goes? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, from like just poi spinning point of view, I'm um, yeah like something I like to explore more and more. I like really going back to some like really simple things and finding. The, the the right ways to, to pass it on to other people and realizing a lot of things about like extensions and like um the way the, the body works within yeah within the circular patterns that we're doing i mean it's more like what i really enjoy like in long term i can say something that i'm like geeking about right now mm -hmm. but i mean this, this approach is something uh, that's my approach like um i'm discovering more and more as i'm teaching how some really simple things are really difficult for many people that I kind of take for granted and I consider them to be super easy because they have just became like the, the core of my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, they're not that easy often for, for others. And yeah, I mean, um, I think like, you know, the whole circular motion that we're doing with Poi, there is so much hidden in that that can inspire us to or lead to the body movement based on that, that I, I love like, uh, yeah, exploring the possibilities of like alignments between different parts of the body and this whole thing of like, what's the focus of the poi versus different part of the body? Is that the the poi leading is is your body leading and and the poi obeys, you know? And like, um, yeah, this discovering like a lot of like symmetrical patterns, like repeating everything on both sides and just finding the most easy, smooth, natural way of executing any move, like learning to really properly extend everything out and yeah, I, I think um, there's space for for people to to explore this a, a little and, bit more. And you have become so. I don't know if you're all always this way, but you have really become so acrobatic in a lot of ways. And you're applying um, patterns that you're doing with poi, and you're taking it to a new level with your stage presence and the way that you're able to you know hold space on the stage. I mean, I saw it firsthand, and it's just um, it's mm -hmm. really has inspired me to try. Uh, to start kind of having more of a performer approach to poi and less of a like i'm just a poi spinner like i am mm -hmm. a poi spinner but i'm also i want to be a performer i want to be yeah um you know an, an entertainer so i think you you really do a great job in this mm -hmm. um and um 
Yeah, I, I very much respect your your approach to this and the, the things. Yeah, that I'm happy to give you some tips or whatever or share. Like, yeah, I mean, I've done like really a lo lot of shows in my life. Yeah. And, what? So what? How did that start for you? How did that? How are the like the acrobatic and like the real performance aspect start? I, don't know, actually, like, I just think like um, from a from a point of view of like the audience or doing like using poi on stage. Honestly, like this may sound weird, but poi is not my favorite prop when it comes to doing shows for public it's three staffs or something that's like kind of bigger, you know? <laughs> mm. And like, I, I never felt like what I actually do with Poi, I mean, people can find it beautiful or something, but like, I still feel like it's very subtle for for most of like shows. If you're performing for 1000 people, like I just feel like whatever Poi tricks I'm doing aren't enough. So I'm like, yeah, I have really like a movement based style when it comes to performing is for public your approach towards practice and training do you have a more regimented style in in the ways that you're practicing or do you do you kind of more take the approach of whatever i feel like working on today i i'm gonna go ahead and work on that do you how do you how do you approach that mm, yeah no i um I don't know the word you said re regi what <laughs> reg regimented is more like strict <laughs> like I'm yeah. going to work on this for X amount of time. I'm working on this pattern or, or yeah. you kind of, yeah, like. Well, I, I do have that. It's not like I have really a schedule and a timer and I follow it like strictly, like when you're doing a workout or something. But I mean, there's a set of things with both, both staffs and, and Poi that I that kind of tend to repeat, repeatedly practice. And yeah, I'm happy when I find like at least three, four hours to practice I'd love to say every day, but honestly, my life now with having so many things to do, it's kind of hard to find that. But whenever I can, I do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like I said, like I've discovered a lot of like a lot of inspiration in just practicing something on and on again until until I get it. And um, yeah, I do also sometimes like just play music and and sort of you know, dance or improvise or do something. But I, I think I do it less and less. Like 10 years ago, I was ju just doing that. And I thought like, that's what you do with poi and practicing something over and over is boring. I guess like with spinning tricks, I don't think I ever like really spend like an hour in front of a mirror just doing one trick mm -hmm. because it's also hard to say like when you've succeeded, you know, like also for me, like I think that the art of, of like being good in spinning poi is like really coming up with interesting variations and, and transitions and stuff. These are sometimes hard to practice, but yes, I, I, I do that a bit. But like tosses and juggling has opened the doors of like that kind of regular practice style of just taking concepts and moves and breaking things down and throw it and catch it. And yeah, and I'm trying to do, yeah, stretch and do some acrobatics here and there. I used to do that more than I do now, but yeah like so pushing. so yeah. we're gonna we're gonna do the the it is now the time in the podcast where we're gonna do our little fun segment where we have uh fans write in and ask questions and um joey picks the his favorite question to ask you so if we if we catch you off guard you do your best job at improvising as you do and um, <laughs> just go ahead and respond to the question to the best of your ability i will turn it over to joey hey what's going on with yo joey so the question was, um, the ad is Rixie Ghoul. She asked, if your flow was summed up in one song, what would it be? Oh, I, I'm happy that this is a music oriented. I like that there's the word flow and song in one sentence, because to me, those are absolutely yeah two elements that are paired in such an important way that um, cannot be unpaired. <laughs> For me, there's just no flow without music. And uh, yeah, there's music without flow, but <laughs> well, it's hard to pick a song, really. It's changing. And that's like the, the, the main thing about it. It's like, is my life's changing and my, and like, like music adds colors to my, to my life in some way, you know, like it's really like fills me with inspiration in many ways and always represents maybe some type, some era of my life. And, and so it does like affect my sort of flow. So um, I'd say um, I'm happy to share my <laughs> Spotify uh, playlist with like 300 of those songs. Sweet. And uh, please, I think each of do. them at least inspired me once. Amazing. Yeah. And that was a really good answer, you know, as your as your life changes and um, as you're experiencing new things, you're, you're going to find things that 
uh, or songs that apply to you and hit you at a more, um, you know, deeper and more significant level. And and you are a, a musician, so I thought that was a beautiful question. Um, yeah, great question on that, that, Joey. Yeah. Um, and, and and just going back to your to your career as an artist, um, I mean, you you have done so many things as far as a musician and a performer and instructor, all these things, a videographer. Um, you've done so many things. So what what are some of the if you had to point to some of the highlights of your career on any front, what, what do you think are, have been some of the biggest moments in your life as far as an artist mm. goes? Yeah. I'm not good in like picking those, like, you know, the best moments or best songs or best sure. videos. Like this. Yeah, 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 I, often, yeah. I, I enjoy the, the space between all those best, best things, you know, like uh, I think my, the highlight about my artistic career is like, is, the, the fight that it's been going on for so long and I'm, I'm still excited about it. I really enjoy like the fact of like do, doing different artistic things. So like if I'm on a plane from a show to do a concert next day and then shoot something the day after, I really enjoy that. Like just transitioning mm -hmm. between different, different things and feeling like life is fun. <laughs> you know, like, um, what my current goal is, and that's related with something that I like, I guess from my current sort of perspective, I consider as um, important or sort of exciting is like really just finally after 15 years like getting more into creating real acts and like um, shows that have some sort of like idea because I, I knew that my the time will come for me when I will just like not only practice and do tricks but I will really focus on what am I doing with this and who am I why am I doing this on stage you know and um, yeah like recently I've been really getting into that thinking a lot like creating different light light show acts and like now with some like kind of fire things i i got like um some like kind of effects like some igniters that like explode something on stage <laughs> at a point and like I've, I've been trying to like program fire i just did this show like a few days ago because i like when things happen unexpectedly and it's kind of like um yeah it gives you like space to to react to something and that's for that reason I really love like light things, right? I've been mm -hmm. really into making light shows, like uh, with more than just like spinning light, but really like programming it. And uh, I just decided I really want to program fire too. So I got these like programmable ign igniters that should like ignite things on stage. And I mean, but, but this, that just uh, like a small example of some things that sure. I'm really getting into, like uh, in terms of like music and uh, sounds and like working with soundtracks. And uh, yeah. Um, also, like recently, I've been asked by um, a really amazing Czech artist, and I like to to work on a on a performance with him for the National Theatre of Czech Republic, and uh, like for for this theatre company, which is like known to be the like leading um, multimedia theatre, like really um, innovative theatre and dance company. Like uh, it, it's been, yeah, it's a, it's a really famous. And it's a really famous theater company. It's residential in the National Theater of, of Czech. And uh, like I, the, the fact that I'm getting into this project means so much for me because it's uh, somehow I, like I've always felt like I'd love to enter the the official circus or theater world a little bit more than just like spinning things by myself somewhere or doing like things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Funny story for y'all at home really quick while we're on the subject. Uh, we were hanging out. It was after Kindle Northwest. We were in Portland and uh, we were getting a beer at this uh, this place uh, with some friends after this festival. And <laughs> you you told me, oh, it's like, OK, so what's your plan moving forward? Like, what, what are you doing after this? And you're like, oh, I have to be back in, I believe it was Czech Republic or wherever the hell you were going. But you're like, yeah, I have to choreograph this light show and and uh it's this big thing event tomorrow with this thing and i'm like this man's life is a fucking movie like you're you're yeah. going from yeah. that's what i enjoy so like sometimes so it's cool. extremely tiring man and uh like i've been yeah seeing the side effects of of that like um occasionally sometimes i feel like i'm just like I love to organize things and then I'm like so tired I can't even enjoy them anymore. It's like I want to bring all those people together and I'm like too tired to even enjoy them. They're present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean there are definitely downsides of like doing many things. And yeah, now I've been really thinking about like the negative impact of, of this on my life. I mean I'm leaving this subject that you asked about, but yeah, this is something that I guess uh, so big uh, priority for me right now to like just I deal with so many things every day, like getting so many messages and like my phone has just became like 
uh, too much of an important thing um, or like point of focus that I find it even difficult to to like to really stop thinking about it. You know, like live in anticipation that I have to do something, respond to this. This is like urgent. I have to do that and that and that. These people are waiting for this. And um, yeah, I'm. I think it, this really uh, contributes to like a loss of focus a little bit when it comes to my life. Like I used to be able to like just look at a volcano for a whole day and that would be enough. I think I've lost that uh, ability a little bit. However, yeah, I mean, back to that subject, I mean, that I hope, it, it seems that I'm going to be like collaborating with like a big theater company doing like bringing also flowers onto the stage of the National Theater check and just being asked to join this project with some like LED stuff and like, um, yeah, this means so much for me like to to be taken into um, a project like that. I mean, I've worked on many big shows with many big fire or LED companies in, around the world, but I always wanted to enter a different scene with this, like to to take it on a really contemporary stage, like a contemporary art stage. And uh, yeah, I may have this opportunity now. And uh, that sounds really good. I hope it's gonna work out in a year and a half. I'm sure it will. Premiere. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just, yeah, getting more into like finding how to use all those things that I've learned how to do in a way where I feel are like meaningful and and creating like something that I feel is artistically valuable because I'm doing a lot of shows that is just to entertain the audience. I do enjoy that a lot. It's the best job I could wish for. But on artistic level, there are goals that I would like to achieve. And mm -hmm. uh, money is not absolutely part of that game. I want to just, yeah, express some ideas and... I want to show also flow arts in a way where, yeah, it's um, celebrates the real beauty of it in some way. So yeah, and you're you're at this stage in your career when you're just so multi multifaceted and you're doing so many different things, um, and you're just involved in a lot of different projects. So I I think you're somebody who I was just so excited to have on the podcast uh, for this reason because you you have um, a lot to give as far as conversation and, and perspective. Um, you've been in this for a long time, learned a lot of things throughout the time of being a performer and organizer, and, you know, you're just really killing it in a lot of different ways. So, um, there's a lot of different avenues and a lot of different ways to support this man. Um, you know, you're on Patreon, you're on, you know, YouTube, Instagram. Um, what, what are some of the ways that people can support you and help you out in, um, uh, nowadays? Yeah. I mean, if people like poi which i guess they do and that's why i listen to this podcast i've really put so much energy into making those tutorials that are on my patreon and soon up on a new platform that we're working on which is poitutorials.com platform which will eventually be finished but it just haven't been finished yet yeah i mean i am um, i love passing on some poi knowledge and if people want to support me and learn poi and look into different things my patreon is definitely the, the place to go as um yeah i put a lot of time into making those tutorials that are out there. yeah I and dude I can tell just just I can I mean the the t my favorite tutorial uh ever you have done um it's <laughs> incredible it's so good I uh, will we'll definitely link link it um in here at some point uh, on the YouTube or whatever but I mean I've I've shared it and kind of given my own take on it and um hopefully tried to support you in my own ways but um yeah the the diligence and the the ways that you have uh you know, been able to teach. And I, I think you have such a, such a powerful way of teaching. I think you probably took a lot of ways from Nick and a lot of the, the, you know, inspiration from him and applied it in your own way. I, so I Ronan, just want to highlight that. Yeah, Ronan, Ronan been, as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, I've got a lot from, from this guy's way of teaching. Thanks to. Teaching yeah. With him. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And, and the, even just as far as like the graphics, um, I know that's probably not that difficult of a thing to do, but you really made it so visual, not even just with what you're doing, but really laying it out, laying out the pattern of what you're doing. Um, so just kudos to you. Huge shout out. I I've been loving the tutorials. So if y'all really want to check them out, please do. Uh, he's an incredible teacher and uh, I hope to, to catch you at some festival in the U S I'll be I want to come over to your um, events and the things that you do as far as retreats and all that stuff. Yeah, you're point. always very welcome, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to. Inviting you to, to all until you come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds good. But yeah, I, I want to catch you, um, catch one of your classes here in the U S at some point. Do you, do you have any plans on coming to the U S this year at all? 
Uh, not this year, really. I think uh, probably in the winter when I'm going to go to Guatemala and yeah, be on that continent, I might show up in some somewhere and do some workshop. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, all or people from the United States, um, the the Guatemalan retreat is uh, is not far, <laughs> and that's a great Truly. place. To, great place to go to to learn poi, and it's a beautiful place too. Guata Flow, what a great name! <laughs> yes. That was very random. Too. At least it's <laughs> well. Well, um, it's been a seriously one of my favorite episodes so far. Thank you very much for for contributing to the project. I'm very Thank glad you, that Patrick. we were able to arrange this time frame for both of us. You worked with me on Thank this, you. and um, you guys yeah. are amazing for having woken up this early to make this happen <laughs> you yeah. are a man that i will wake up early for Voita. nice and i so. also do want to say that like all the people are watching this podcast i think what these two guys are doing is really amazing too and they deserve to be supported too so i'm sure there are some some ways to do that somewhere in the description on somewhere but uh yeah i think this is great what you're doing really like, thank you um, yeah and I, I feel good in this interview like uh you guys are yeah, you're nice to talk to, and it's um, yeah, it's been it has felt good. <laughs> Thank you, man. I I've been working on my skills as a host, and I love podcasting, and so this this does mean a lot to me. So um, thank you very much again. I think we're at a great place to close it out, but it's been an yeah. absolute honor. I hope to see you again soon, my friend, and good luck with all the things that you have going on. Um, make sure to support Voita in any ways that you can. It's been a thank great you, episode. Thank you, yep. guys. Thank you. Right, I'll see you soon, day. buddy. <laughs> All right. Thanks.